Paths to God, Living the Bhagavad Gita by Ram Das, author of the classic book Be Here Now. Copyright 2004 by Ram Das. Personally abridged by Dustin Cormier. Preface and introductory notes. The battle. The battle in the Bhagavad Gita represents the sublime struggle of willpower and surrender to God. It's like the battle is a metaphor for the inner struggle for genuineness and naturalness in every person, of spiritual goodness and compassion. The other side of the battle is the opposite of those qualities, of fear, of non-self-awareness, of evil, non-unity, and hatred. Our kith and kin may be on the other side, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't fight for what is truly right, for what is optimal in ourselves. Arjuna's side represents the true self, surrender to the Tao, the natural, doing what you feel is right and what is best, unity and love, awareness, connectedness, willingness, consciousness. Arjuna is you, is us, our true, deep self. Duryodhana's side represents evil, lack of spiritual quality, unwillingness to surrender to nature, isolation, fear, destruction, non-self-awareness. It represents the delusion that ego is all there is. Your friends, family, and even your closest of teachers may be on Duryodhana's side because that's where circumstance and perception has appointed them. But you must do what is right anyway, despite all opposition, and do your duty. Follow your dharma, your inner truth. Defeat is being used as a metaphor for non-engagement in life. To be consumed by the other side in this divine battle is to succumb to non-self-awareness, ego worship, the cycle of samsara, attachment and aversion, etc., non-surrender to God, autopiloted isolation, to be defeated is to become ignorant of your true self. Excerpt from the book. The philosophy of the Gita is one that turns out to be especially suitable in the West, because instead of encouraging us to turn away from the world, it turns our lives in the world into our spiritual work. We're a culture of doers, and so, as Ram Das's course description pointed out, many of us find that karma yoga is the most suitable practice. Karma means action. Henry David Thoreau said that in comparison with the Gita, our modern world and its literature seem puny and trivial. Ralph Waldo Emerson called it the voice of an old intelligence. The Gita is at once an instruction manual for living a spiritual life and a profound ecstatic vision of the ultimate nature of God. It is both historical document and perennial philosophy. The various yogas are paths for coming to union with God. The Gita isn't a book about Krishna. The Gita is Krishna. I think that we are all being prepared, all of us, to serve in that capacity of reinvesting our society with living spirit. And that happens through our becoming spirit, because the only thing you can really transmit to another person is your being. The fancy words don't mean a thing. Stages, levels in the evolution of consciousness, characterized in the Gita. This is the stages of the Gita's story and substance. First, there's despair. Then there's possibility. Then there's the beginning of awakening. Then comes the mystic vision and the deepening of the direct experience. That's in chapters 7 through 12, which could be called part 2 of the Gita, the very nature of God. Then after chapter 12 comes the last part, which happens when the faith is strong. There's an opening to the deeper wisdom. What the Gita does is to present us with a template for expanding our definitions of who we are, and therefore for appreciating our lives in a whole new context. The Gita is designed in an interesting way. Everything that really needs to be said is pretty much said in the first two chapters. After that, it's said over and over again, but with more and more exquisiteness and with more and more detail. The whole book becomes like a spiral, and we find that we see the themes of the Gita from many vantage points as it unfolds, and our engagement deepens. The Background Context Duryodhana, the evil brother who became king of the evil side, has finally pushed the Pandavas too far. The Pandavas are Arjuna's family, the spiritual side. 
The Pandavas have no choice but to fight. Injustice has taken over their kingdom. Arjuna and his brothers have been cheated and lied to. Truth has been trampled on. The Dharma has to reassert itself. The good guys must make a statement and fight. Krishna's help was requested by both Duryodhana and Arjuna's side. Duryodhana chose a bigger army and loads of weapons and external tools. And Arjuna chose to have Krishna on his side. Forget the armies, said Arjuna with his mind toward God. All I want is God on my side. Krishna was a mischievous cowherd as a boy, a rascal. But no one punished him because he was so captivating. And of course, he played a great flute. Wherever Krishna went, everyone wanted to hang out with him. He is perhaps the most joyful avatar we have. He was always playful, laughing, active, enthusiastic. He was like warm, radiant life itself, which is an incredible image to have of God. Krishna lived as a perfect yogi, giving away everything he had, always helping everyone. And in the course of that, he befriended the Pandavas. Arjuna. Arjuna is a kshatriya, a member of the warrior caste. He's a prince and a pure, good son. He does his duty perfectly. He's very intelligent and moral, but he's basically very practical and pragmatic. He's a man of action, making him an appropriate mirror for our own society, because ours is that kind of active, rajasic culture. While Duryodhana is very ego-centered, getting more and more haughty as control slips from him, Arjuna takes a different track. He turns to God. Because he is very principled and his karma is good, he's ready for the next step. He's fit to receive higher knowledge. Arjuna's complaints and despairs. Here's somebody about to go to battle, but then he takes a good look at the guys he's supposed to fight against, and when he looks at them, he suddenly sees that they're not them, but us. All of a sudden, the whole identification with national interests is in conflict with a different identification, an identification with the brotherhood of man. At what point do people become them instead of us? Also, he sees the conflict as a potential breakdown of family loyalties. He's attached to family, not only by bonds of affection, but by binding social ties. In order to fulfill his dharma, he's being asked to set aside not only family love, but family loyalty, which flies in the face of some very powerful values in Arjuna's culture. Arjuna's being asked to turn his back on all of that and to act out a completely different set of motives. Basically, to rely on what Krishna, or God, his internal divinity, tells him to do. The only thing that makes possible that level of transformation in our behavior is a deep inner change, a change so profound that it makes us willing to go up against things we would never have dreamed of questioning or opposing. It requires a change that shifts the very source from which our actions are determined. That experience is familiar to many of us. We find ourselves growing up within a set of traditions and cultural expectations, how to cut your hair, how you should live, where to go to school and what type of education to get, how much to pay for your car, etc. Many of us in the 60s found ourselves in conflict with some of those values. We know how painful it was and the inner wrenching we felt. That's the experience Arjuna is facing at Kurukshetra, and it's significant for us when we uncover the parallel experiences in ourselves so that we can empathize with him. Jesus Christ said, He who loves mother or brother more than me cannot follow me. That's the first level of Arjuna's predicament. But it's only the first level. That's just the beginning of it. The game in the Gita is much bigger than that. At a deeper level, it's really about all of that versus higher consciousness. It's about the game of awakening, about the game of coming into spirit. The next level, the inside looking out, the non-thinking mind. Arjuna's arguments are based on his social roles, which means they are based on models of himself from the outside looking in. That's the objective model, which is the model of the thinking mind. And what will be demanded of Arjuna is that he let go not only of some particular models of himself, but of his very reliance on the thinking mind out of which the models have come. As we awaken, we begin to act from the inside out rather than from the outside in. And that's the transformation we're really looking for. 
It leads to behavior based on an awakened heart. Awakening. Awakening is like moving from one plane to another in the flow of consciousness. And at times it may seem that we're being forced to go against the current of the old plane in order to come into some deeper harmony with the new one. Arjuna is going to have to give up seeing himself as, quote, somebody who doesn't go to war against family. He's going to have to give up the entire system on which he's been basing his actions. He's going to have to give up his models about protecting family and caste. He's going to have to change the way he defines himself. And doing that will crack his ego and take him to the next stage. Shiva Doctrine. Nothing to hold on to. No anchorage. What happens when we face this stripping away of our models is that we will give up this and that and grab on to that and this. We substitute a new set of attachments for the old ones. We give up family, social forms, and start clinging to spiritual leaders and forms. Uh-oh, big clearance, everything must go. Knowing that makes us feel very vulnerable. There's no authority we can turn to. Nobody to tell us what to do. We can only keep turning to our hearts, listening for what feels like the right move. We have nothing to hold on to. This is the ecstatic doctrine. Arjuna is faced with the kind of discipline which Trungpa Rinpoche talked about in his book Cutting Through Spiritual Materialism. The discipline of not being attached to any patterns whatsoever. The discipline of standing nowhere. It's terrifying to stand on the edge that way, to have no definitions you can cling to, no reference groups, no identifications, no self-concepts, no models. Will you dare do it? Will you dare throw everything over? The message in the Gita has to begin with this crisis situation. Arjuna has to be shaken to his roots, a reference that potentially resonates with soma, psychedelics, and the ego-death experience, before he can listen to what Krishna has to say to him. Arjuna wasn't ready before to hear about what Krishna had to tell him. Not until they found themselves in the middle of a battlefield, not until that moment of crisis awakened Arjuna, was he ready to hear something new. And that something new will take Arjuna on a journey from giving up his attachment to things like family encased to letting go of his attachment even to form itself. Because that is the deepest level of the Gita's teachings. The final thing Arjuna faces is Shiva. He faces God in the form of chaos. God in the form of destruction. The destruction of all of our illusions. You cannot use reason to understand God's law. A terrifying fact. In the Ramayana, another classic Indian spiritual literature, Ram says over and over, Unless you honor Shiva, you cannot come to me. That is until you have fully embraced the existence of chaos. Chaos. You cannot go through the door. If you wish to preserve love and beauty, you've got to be able to look at the destruction of love and beauty with wide open eyes and accept it. In nature, there is creation, preservation, and destruction. Surrender to God. At Kurukshetra, the sublime battlefield, Arjuna comes face to face with Shiva. He's confronting a situation in which his reasoning won't work. A situation in which surrender is the only way through. He must give up all his attachments and forms. We see our dilemma in that quote from the Gospel of Matthew. If anyone wishes to come after me, said Christ, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For he who would save his life loses it, but he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Chapter 2. Karma and Reincarnation. Page 35 of the book. Understanding something like reincarnation cannot be done through the intellect or through knowledge. Knowing something comes from the rational mind, and that is part of this lifetime. To understand it, we must rely on a higher wisdom, on the inner voice we talked about. Maharaji, Ram Dass's guru, took reincarnation for granted, and his truth communicated itself to Ram Dass. Krishna said, of this reincarnation, the sage has no doubts. And that was good enough for Maharaji. Quotes about reincarnation. Rumi, the Persian mystic. 
I died as a stone and rose again as a plant. I died as a plant and became an animal. I died as an animal and was born a man. Why should I fear? When was I less by dying? Yet once more shall I die as a man to soar with the angels. But even from angelhood I must pass on, for all is change except the face of God. Muhammad said, Each person is a mask which the soul puts on for a season. It is worn for the proper time and then is cast off, and another is worn in its stead. Note, back in Christ's time, reincarnation was a common belief, but around 500 to 600 after death, the early Christian church councils, after a long, heated debate, decided that it wasn't so functional a philosophy for maintaining control. After all, if this life was merely one step in a continuing dance, you could not be frightened about an eternity of hellfire and brimstone. So that's why the church denounced reincarnation. Rodney Collin, in his book The Theory of Celestial Influence, had an interesting slant on reincarnation. He said, It isn't like you're born and then you die and then you're born again five years later. It's really more like a fifth dimension. We've all been here, right here, in this very time and place, thousands of times. We've been running through the very same lifetime again and again. Don't you remember? I've told you a thousand times. I've told you a thousand times. Colin's view of deja vu is that it comes because the circuitry burns through occasionally, and we get a little flash of the last time we did this. People argue, if reincarnation is true, why don't I remember my past lives? Lama N. Garika, the Tibetan teacher, answered, Most people don't remember their births, and yet they don't doubt that they were recently born. They forget that active memory is only a small part of our consciousness, and that our subconscious memory preserves every past impression and experience, which our waking minds fail to recall. This resonates with Carl Jung's theory of the collective unconscious. More on reincarnation. Krishna says, For beyond time he dwells in these bodies, though these bodies have an end in their time. But he remains immeasurable, immortal. The trouble with talking about reincarnation that way, he dwells in these bodies, he remains, can make what stays sound awfully solid, like there's a somebody passing through birth and death. But if not a somebody, then what is it? The Buddha believed in reincarnation, which means he thought that something reincarnates. The Pali literature says, There are no real ego entities hastening through the ocean of rebirth, but merely life waves, which, according to their nature and activities, manifest themselves here as men, there as animals, and elsewhere as invisible things. In Hinduism, these life waves are called vasanas, subtle thought forms. Karma and vasanas, life waves. Every act we do creates vasanas based on the desires connected with the act. Those life waves go out and out. Even when we die, they continue. The physical body dies, and all that remains are those subtle life waves, those mental tendencies that function like a kind of psychic DNA code to determine your next round. In Hinduism, that's called karma. Karma is basically a pattern of life waves, or desire waves, that keep going, life after life, until they spend themselves. Free will and determinism exist simultaneously on different planes. Karmic law. If you experience your present life from that perspective as one sequence in a long unfolding pattern of karmic law, then the time and place you took birth, what your parents are like, etc., you'll see all of that as a part of a predetermined karmic package. The universe and you in it are just an ongoing expression of karmic law. Both of those realities, freedom of choice and predeterminism, exist simultaneously, just on different planes. There's a plane of reality on which you think you're a free agent. You think you decided what to wear today or what to eat today. On that plane, it's necessary to behave as if, in fact, you are a free agent, to make choices wisely, to decide to do your dharma. However, there's also another plane, a different perceptual vantage point, from which you begin to see that those thought forms that said, eat that granola today, 
arose out of a long chain of prior events that absolutely predetermined your decisions. I say, I have free will. That's my karma talking. Free will is on one lower plane. Karmic law and determinism is on another higher plane. Ram Das recounts a story of driving a tour bus full of hippies to look for his wise guru, Maharaji, in Delhi, India. They came to a fork in the road. One way led to a detour, the Mela Grounds, where a famous holy event was taking place. The other led to Delhi. Ram Das made a last-minute, whimsical decision to choose to go to the holy grounds. There, they found Maharaji, who greeted them expectedly. He had prepared a meal and lodging for all 35 bus passengers. Quote, Long before I made my decision to visit the grounds, it was already decided. Maharaji knew all about it that morning. I played my part. I decided to go to the Mela grounds. But the decision was inevitable. Gradually, as our perspective deepens, we begin to see our own lives in the context of a wider purpose. We begin to look at our melodramas and our desires and sufferings, and instead of seeing them as events happening within a lifetime bound by life and death, we begin experiencing them as a part of a vaster design. Karma and Arjuna Although he's beginning to awaken, Arjuna's desires, or rather, his attachment to his desires, are still very much hanging around. That's the predicament in which most of us find ourselves, isn't it? We're caught in divided territories inside ourselves. There's that part of us which sees through the game, and then there's that part of us that is still deeply caught in all our stuff. We have a foot in two worlds. Although Arjuna is graced to be in an incarnation through which he awakens, he still has a long way to go, and Krishna is in the process of training him to take the next step, to evolve to a point where the acts he performs will no longer come out of attachment, any attachment, and not coming out of attachment, they will no longer create new karma. If we want to be done with it all, it's clear that the first step in the process is to stop making new waves. And as Krishna explains, the only way to stop making new waves is to stop basing our actions on attachment. Once we're acting purely out of dharma and not out of any desire, we're no longer making any waves, like a pond with no ripples. That's why Krishna is giving Arjuna this whole new basis for determining his actions. He is saying, it's your karmic predicament to have been born a kshatriya at this particular moment in this particular place where it is your responsibility to uphold the dharma by fighting this war. Your feelings for those on the other side don't matter. Something bigger is at stake here. We are merely a part of a process. No permanent me. I am a process of continuing mind moments, each one separate from the others. There is no permanent me being incarnated and reincarnated. There is merely the law of cause and effect, cause and effect, cause and effect, running on and on and on. It's all just the passing parade of the laws of prakriti, of the laws of nature, of the laws of an unfolding illusion of manifestation. The more you open to this perspective, the more dispassionate you become in watching your own incarnation unfold. You see that every melodrama just creates more karma. Finally, there is no stance you can hold to and still go through the door, so you let go of everything. That's why Krishna says to Arjuna, let go of your models and do your dharma. You can't wage war against your destiny, so let the laws of karma unfold as they're supposed to. Play out the role that's assigned to you, because when you do, you've totally surrendered to your dharma. You're no longer trying for anything. That's your way through. Why be upset about the idea of fighting your family? It's their karma and yours for this battle to take place. Arjuna's argument turns the discussion on its head. All Arjuna's actions are going to have to start coming from a new place. All those social rules, they had their time and place. But Arjuna's feelings about family and social roles can no longer be the central values in his shaping his actions, because his central value is now going to Brahman by fulfilling his dharma. He has a new purpose behind his acts. As we begin to adopt the Gita's perspective as our own, notice that our focus starts to change. 
Instead of always preoccupying ourselves with trying to get what we think we want or need, we'll start to quiet. We'll start to listen. We'll wait for that inner prompting. We'll try to hear rather than decide what it is we should do next. And as we listen, we'll hear our dharma more and more clearly. So we'll begin tuning more and more of our acts to that place of deeper wisdom. As that happens, all our fascinations with our roles and our plans and our desires and melodramas will begin to fall away. More and more, we open ourselves to just being instruments of the Dharma. I am an instrument of the Dharma, the Tao.